The other dimension you're going to encounter is dynamics. And so networks are constantly changing, but to different degrees in different ways. And so taking that same analogy from earlier, we might again have three different communities, different connections, colors mean different groups, and there are different edges, there are certain types of hubs. But you might be measuring over time, and generically you could start to see that not only will those particular edges and configurations change, the strengths and the distances of things, but you might actually lose the idea of separate things eventually. So as you're familiar with brains growing up from birth, uh, they're going to be putting out lots of connections and pruning them and reconfiguring. There's a sort of, again, a general template, but then there are variations around this theme. So what is the theme that the brain ends up on at a high level of organization that is used for many different things? There aren't a ton of things that we can say that are generalizable from network neuroscience, but there are a couple that really help get us uh, halfway there. So one thing that seems to come out is that the most dynamic networks are also coincident as hub networks. They sit at the middle of a lot of things and they move around a lot between things. So if I'm gonna change when I'm moving around during different tasks, there's one network that's gotten a lot of fanfare. I'm gonna call your attention to this big frontal parietal network. Famously in a lot of different clinical syndromes, this is the thing that might break first. Uh, if it's not directly affected, it's indirectly affected. It's associated with your inability to switch your attention, inhibit things you don't want to say, reason conceptually about abstract things. And interestingly, Cole and colleagues some years ago now showed that if I just kind of ask somebody to do all kinds of different tasks, I have the same person switching from thing to thing to thing while we're doing an fMRI scan, it turns out that not only is this network recruited a lot, this network changes its connectivity with everything else a lot. And indeed, people have gone to show, if I go in and then give people a stroke in this region or something that's kind of right on the edge, these uh, kind of connector hubs between the communities, the entire system becomes dysfunctional. So you can think of things being isolated within systems and breaking down and affecting discrete sets of functions. You can also think about things on the boundaries between these breaking pairs of functions. And then you can think about major systems like the front or prior network breaking down, ruining lots of functions. And so literally the system can't connect the way it needs to to do all kinds of different tasks. So for me as a network scientist, one of the things you're looking for, it's not just can I describe the structures, it's can I describe something I couldn't before, predict something I couldn't before, and now tell you about the mechanics of how it works in a way I couldn't before. So that leads us to the idea of, all right, well, that promise, that question I led with is, can we get something like a complete view of cognition? And I think that this is what calls a lot of people to think of themselves as a network scientist. As you see that these tools can be used everywhere and navigate between these levels and these concepts, it's really, really compelling to use them as a theory. So it pulls for, there's a network science theory. I can describe the mathematics of how these things emerge and how they move, how they change over time. Maybe that's going to help us solve this problem. So I think that I'm just going to give you a little intuition for probably where we are. So this problem hasn't gone away. We still have anatomy in the brain. There's still plenty of wonderful work just trying to understand that, believe it or not. We still don't know everything about the anatomy of the brain. It's been over 100 years, but we're, we're still working on it. You can zoom in on these pieces and study it at various scales, but you can also I notice that there's heterogeneity in what gets computed across the brain. If you think about this at differences in scale, you'll notice that this is consistent with applying network analysis. So you can do two things at once. You can say, within each level of organization, I can be interested in how things are connected to one another. I can also be interested in how things at this level of organization, cellularly, are grouped together in bigger communities to bridge computations. And so one of the uh, nice themes of research from some groups is, well, I'm, I've kind of taken something up here in this more uh, dorsal parietal region, maybe similar kinds of computations are recruited together into different bigger components. And so this helps us kind of navigate our way through this combinatorial problem. I could be thinking about every single piece is important and different, or I could be conceptually testing the idea that is there some self-similarity in computation recruited into different systems? And if we're doing good behavioral <coughs> cognitive work, I might have a good guess about, well, here's a distinction between the two. You want to pair those two together. It turns out that there's a lot of really good recent work showing that if I just kind of look at what's passively correlated, so I do some fMRI, the person's again sitting in the scanner for a while, they're going to come out with certain prototypic networks like you saw on the previous slide. They're going to kind of group together. 
Turns out everybody's is a little bit different, but you can look around and see similar objects across people organized in different ways. So I don't have time to get into that, but for instance, with Dr. Hamilton's work, even just knowing where you aim the stuff has a lot to do with how these are grouped up in this particular brain. But if I look in that particular brain, ask how these things are connected up, the things that activate together during different tasks, the way that their patterns shape, are to a large extent shaped by how they're communicating most of the time anyway. And so if we can play that game, we can actually push it down another level, which is often not talked about, which again, way back in the beginning, I mentioned this image here where we have these nice diffusion tensor and related techniques where we can pull out the anatomy and connections. But anytime you have something talking in the brain, there had to be some physical way for that communication to occur. So through long distance electrochemical communication, presumably we're transmitting messages across pathways that are physically embedded in the brain. It's important to know that these technologies have some really frank limitations to their accuracy to date, but the idea here is can we get estimates that are better than nothing at predicting both the way the brain works and how it's related to behavior. And the good news is that when you start to pair these things together, we can ask about the relationships to cognition and behavior. We can parse out which systems are recruited for what, how the anatomy supports and separates those systems, and then the question I would say is that we've kicked most of this as a can down the road, where I don't know that I have an example where I can say convincingly just importing the network science technique has solved the cognitive problem. Often it's helped us better describe the problem in the systems. It might help us predict the, paper, uh, the behavior better than I could have otherwise. But I'm not sure I've gotten anything close to, you know, this is the map it would take to rebuild this car and then predict where it would go. So our language, our way of kind of taking that ontology of what minds are and how they work in the brain, uh, I would say has a more sort of florid descriptive language, has wonderful mathematical tools, but we still have to be good cognitive neuroscientists about the behaviors we care about and measure and apply. So I think this is the sort of, uh, like any emerging science, there's a lot of flashy breadth, the pictures look fantastic. <laughs> You have to bring your cognitive and critical faculties to that. Um, and I think you need to talk to a good cognitive neuroscientist if you care about cognition and network science. So just a couple words here about, um, it's really important then to notice if you, you haven't intuited it, that you can navigate from ring networks to different scales. So there's, there's, there's nothing illegal about that in the network sense. So I could look down in that brain. I can notice there are other brains around me. I can look at how those brains are connected to me and to one another as a much larger macro community of brains. And indeed, I can come and say, all right, well, maybe I'm somebody that I don't really like grouping up with people. I might be the kind of person that really likes one-on-one -on -one interactions with people of different kinds. And maybe my brain is structurally and functionally organized in a somewhat different way by virtue of that process. It might change how I relate to other people and how I relate to those people might change my brain. And maybe there's some other people that kind of have these scattered networks. And then there might be other people that like to connect to other people who are really well connected. So you think of these as maybe your movers and shakers. They're just kind of up there, they're very visible, and they're moving around. There's something different about them, and it changes something about the brain. Uh, I can't get out of any general talk without talking a little bit about mind control. Uh, people fight with me 30% of the time. So decide in advance what you want to fight me about, see what I have to say, and then come talk to me over dinner. So all I mean by this term is it actually sort of bothers me as a scientist that there's a word like this floating out there for which we have no actual scientific conversation. So really, I, I kind of turn into this skid by saying, if you're going to have a science of mind control, what would that be? Okay? I'm not actually talking that much differently about the things than you might think you would do. So I'm caring about how when I interact through my senses, what that does to my brain and changes my behavior. I think about when I interact with smartphones and social media and friend networks, how that's sort of navigating me around. And then importantly, as Dr. Hamilton was intimating, uh, we have a lot of ways of non-invasively and invasively going into the brain and changing it at different levels of scale. So the mind control problem is I basically am thinking about that brain as some kind of system. I'm putting inputs into it in all kinds of ways, and I'm just expecting outputs out. So as the engineer approaches this, it's as simple as that. It's a system optimization problem from their perspective, and the, the inputs are kind of interesting details from that perspective. But when you start thinking about this, you have some di desired behavior and a desired cognition. So for me and people like Dr. Hamilton, I'm, I'm really doing what I hope is the best thing for a patient, for instance. Or if I'm thinking about trying to build a technology to optimize somebody, 
I really want to know what I'm optimizing, what the trade-offs are, where are the liabilities, what does that mean to equitably or inequitably give it to people. But it usually looks something like this, and you could swap in any one of those symbols from before. And maybe let's say you want to change that behavior and cognition and that's your goal. Well, most of what happens in the literature is the idea that I did my experiment, maybe somebody, you know, I talked to my PhD advisor, he said, do it at one and a half milliamps. And you ask why, he said, I don't know, it's because that's how they did it before, and the review process is gonna be really hard, and I, you know, it's just, it's too hard to think about, we don't know, try it out. It shouldn't be shocking that maybe at best you do nothing, and then sometimes you do worse, right? Because this is a finely tuned organism, and you can kind of nudge things around, and it's often gonna go in the direction you don't want. So when people in engineering think about what's called a closed loop control scheme, um, they're taking things like the output from that behavior and cognition, and they may be reading out brain states, and then they're basically just doing some sophisticated calculation, what the difference between what I want and what I have is, and then we're going to change what we do with this to hopefully start nudging these things into the positive direction. If you're a control theorist about this, the thing you should notice about this, because it applies to any system, is anytime you're doing this to something like this, and I've deliberately taken the network out of it, now just drop a network back into that. Anytime you push one thing around, you should expect some opponent or opposite or nonlinear reaction elsewhere. So for the field at large, we don't have really a science incentivizing trade-offs. I wanna build a treatment that works so I can make that money. I'm not gonna go scrounging around for all these dynamic interactions are. So part of the responsibility in, in construing it as mind control is to say, I really am trying to control something about this. I might expect the effects to be weak. They might be bad, but they also might be a lot of things I'm not measuring. And so as you optimize this as an engineering tool, it helps you to think about, I just have to find good approaches to measuring that and anticipating in advance, which is sort of at the frontier edge as we build techniques like this. Um, so my last example here, kind of the, the scheme generically looks like you have something like that. You might be taking your network measurements here. You want to sort of, uh, in, in one view, start with the anatomy. If I don't know how it's kind of physically communicating, it's harder to estimate how it's functionally communicating. I can zoom in across scales. And then the network story is wonderful because it turns out, as uh, many others have now become keen to and are working on, you can apply energy into that system in a lot of sophisticated mathematical ways to predict, based on how this is physically wired up and how it functionally relates, where I expect that to go in different states. So I can look at several regions, I can look at the entire system. It's a hard problem to optimize, but we can try it out, and there are a lot of mathematical tools for that. And so the, the kind of frontiers in this is thinking about, well, maybe I'm interested in how people represent symbols visually. Like, maybe I care about reinstantiating their visual function. Maybe I present them with something like a bicycle stimulus, but something's misfiring, they see something more like a wine glass. You can pick your favorite example here. The problem would be, well, take some information, you abstract that model away, you have some mathematical tools to estimate how you might inject energy into that to drive it from state zero to some other state. That maybe makes it more likely that I'm gonna be perceiving something like a bicycle in the end. So the good news is, People are hopefully trying to do this in the right direction. And the second piece of good news is most of this doesn't work, so it's more like a mind nudge. So I think that um, one issue that I've uh, started to worry about very seriously, as I know has uh, Anna Wexler here and others in this room, are there are penetrating communities around us. Uh, we know very little about how the public in general reacts to these things, as people funding the work and kind of being a broader part of this community and doing it themselves. We also don't really know, even as acting neuroscientists, most of the trade-offs in what we're doing, right? So as things begin slowly to get more potent, I think we really wanna be careful about thinking about these balances. All right, so with that, I think I'm past time, so I'm gonna call it quits. Thanks for your attention. Thank you.